everyone, welcome back to the Commercial Real Estate Library. Uh, joining us today is Jennifer Kiesmat. She is the founder and CEO of the Kiesmat Group. Uh, Jennifer, can you, for the 1% of people who don't know you or maybe those who aren't based in Toronto, can you give a little, little context of uh, who you are and, and what you're doing now? Sure, so I'm trained as an urban planner. Um, and I worked in the private sector for, I've worked in the private sector for most of my career. I built a large planning and design firm uh, originally called Office for Urbanism that became Dialogue, a national company with offices in Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, and Toronto. And I was recruited from that position to become the chief planner in the city of Toronto. And so I went uh, into the public sector. I did a five-year stint, which is a very American thing to do, to go from the private sector, do a little stint in the public sector and go back. Um, but that's what I did. Uh, I did five years and now I am running a company, uh, my own company with a team of urbanists. We work with cities around the world on urban planning issues. And uh, it's not in the public domain yet, but enough people to know about it so I can say it. Um, I've also created a development company that we'll be announcing in um, in uh, September, and we have our first large site, and we're building um, uh, affordable rental, really high quality affordable rental um, in a mid-rise typology. That is awesome. That's really exciting. Um, it makes me think of, you know, you were, you were kind of at a different scale, actually, but, um, you know, Steve Diamond is one of the most successful developers here in Toronto, and, you know, his background is... Uh, a legal planner navigating that whole environment, and you as the former chief city planner, uh, I'm sure you, <laughs> I'm sure you've got some expertise that you can apply. So that's really cool. Um, well, I have a funny Steve Diamond story if you want to hear it. Yeah. Um, which is that when I started my career and I was just a naive planner straight out of school, um, I was hired to be an expert witness in a project. And Steve Diamond was the lawyer who cross-examined me. And let me just say, uh, there were no kid gloves. Um, it was like, you know, it, it was like a murder trial, for goodness sake, but it was <laughs> planning policy. And um, when the trial, when the, when the whole hearing was done, Steve Diamond came up to me and he grabbed my hand and he said, next time you're on my team. Oh, and there we and go. We've, been, yeah. we've been fast friends ever since. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you how did you hold up during that interrogation? You know, I held my own, um, but we definitely lost the hearing. We were, a, you know, we were really underfunded little group, and uh, that hired me. I think they paid me in like spa coupons or something. I don't I don't even remember. <laughs> um, but it was it was a phenomenal experience and a phenomenal foray into kind of the legal side of the planning process in Ontario. Right. Uh, okay, so we went we rushed right through your entire um, career, but I and we'll we'll get to the end of it uh, or the beginning of this new chapter um, very shortly. But can we go back and talk about? Uh, you, you mentioned you started this planning group that eventually grew to have offices in all over uh, Canada. Can you talk about how that started and how it kind of evolved? Yeah, sure. So um, right out of planning school, I worked in a couple different planning firms and um, I met some colleagues uh, through that process. And we were very idealistic and we decided to create our own company to create a new planning and design firm and uh, both of my partners were architects and so we created a company called office for urbanism and we actually thought that we would spend you know our first five years working on kind of shitty projects and an amazing thing happened which was that we put in a proposal to um to be the planners and urban designers for the union station master plan and we won huh. and so we got like, like we blasted into the planning world. And uh, one of our first projects that we designed um, has now, of course, been named Jurassic Park. Uh, that came out of our plan. Wow. Um, but also the Front Street redesign 
uh, that was our plan. And the whole rebuild, the whole idea behind making Union Station a porous building where you could go straight through the building, north, south, and right through the building, east, west, so that it links into the city to the east and west. That was all from our plan. Um, our plan was all about making it this a building that functioned a bit more like an airport and that you could go through it. At the time, when we started that planning process, you could only enter Union Station through Front Street. So the wow. ACC wasn't built yet. There was no connection to that whole area to the back. And so, you know, we did the first rendering showing a Union Station entrance at the back side of the building where the TELUS building is. We did the building footprint, the placement of those buildings to kind of create that public space of this Jurassic Park. So we very quickly, literally, we were like three people. We put in this huge proposal. We won the job. And it was one of those situations where it was like, yay, we won the job. And then we were like, oh, no. So, you know, we started hiring and hiring and that kind of, you know, it was no turning back from that point forward. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so you could say that you were the reason that uh, the Raptors won the championship last year with the, the fan support. I tend to draw a straight line. I tend to draw a straight line between my little firm and the Raptors winning the championship. <laughs> right. well, that's, yeah, that's the butterfly effect. You never know. Yeah, that no could be the you there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, and then, okay. What, what about this next chapter? So now you have this national firm um, where you know hyper successful, exponential growth curve. Uh, and now you're you're headhunted to become the chief city planner for the city of Toronto. Like, can you talk about a little bit about that and and what is it like coming into the shoes of the chief city planner? Like, what are those first few days like? Well, the first thing I'll say is that when the headhunter first called me, I literally laughed out loud. I and I literally said, "That is a terrible job. Who would want that terrible, <laughs> terrible job?" <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not kidding you, I laughed. And I remember vividly actually leaving my office, which was at uh, Young and Bloor at that time, and I was on my bike. And I remember biking home and kind of giggling out loud and going, who is the loser who would take that terrible job? <laughs> um, and then, you know, they kept calling me back and the conversations progressed. And at one point I said, look, I, I would be a terrible person for that job because these are all the things I think need to be done differently. And the headhunter said, well, can you put some of that in writing? And I thought, well, what the hell? So I wrote, I wrote basically two pages of changes I felt needed to be made. And um, the amazing thing is, is that two pretty phenomenal people at the city, Peter Milchin, who was uh, a city councillor who was charged with hiring the chief planner, and John Libby, the deputy city manager, um, they liked what I wrote and they, the entire five years that I was there, they were phenomenally supportive of the very, you know, outward facing approach that I, that I took to the role. And I couldn't have done it with either, with either one of them. The first couple of days, I'm not kidding. I came from a, a really open concept office, our offices at Dialogue. We had like beanbag chairs and all our walls were in whiteboard paint. And I showed up into a very traditional office where I like closed the door and I was like, where are my people? Like, where are my staff? And I sat at the desk and I had no manual. The very first thing that I got was a, um, uh, a document from the city manager that had all of my delegated authorities. So all of the things that I was delegated that I could do on behalf of city council, decisions that I could make. And this was like a 10 page document and I went through it very carefully. And it was, that was a really cool moment because people always said, oh, the chief planner doesn't have any power. And then you get a document like that and you go, whoa, there's a lot of stuff I can do here. Okay. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of stuff that my predecessors didn't do that they could have done based on this document. And so I read it very, very carefully. And then, you know, I did what any smart planner would do. I created a five year strategic plan. I had committed to be there for five years. So I, I then spent the next two months creating a five year strategic plan. And um, I really used that five year strategic plan as my guidebook for how I went through the job over that five year period. Right. What, 
So, so I mean, I'm in real estate. I, this is horrible, but I love money. I'm a money person. Garrett says he loves power. So what, <laughs> so, so what were some of those powers that you had that you had that maybe jumped out at you that you didn't even know that the city planner could do when you were reading that document? Um, well, right on the face of it, um, some of a lot of it had to do with regulatory powers about very technical things in the planning process. So I'll give you a really specific example. Um, there's a green roof bylaw in the city of Toronto. It's the most extensive green roof bylaw in well really in the world requiring green roofs on buildings and uh those green roofs must be approved by the chief planner this has been delegated to the chief planner and the forgiveness of that policy can is something that can only be done by the chief planner uh, and by the way that policy is an outcome of david miller's legacy when he was the mayor um so you know, I there's a lot of pushback from industry around green roofs and building green roofs in the city. And I um, I think in my five years, 90, 98.6% or something like that of the green roofs that came before uh, city council were um, incorporated into the site plan, meaning that I forgave very little of them. So when developers showed up and said, look, I can't do this green roof, let me give you money instead or do this, I essentially said, no build the green roof <laughs> right. Right. and what was cool about that was that when you make it a requirement and you're inflexible around the requirement it people start to expect that and it kind of resets the industry and so there were lots of things like that where i was pretty inflexible and it led to a reset in the industry which has created this incredible legacy we have more green roofs than any other city in the world right now and i don't know that's a pretty great thing look at global warming um, look at our urban island heat effect and the way our cities are changing. That is a really big, big impact on the livability of the city that, you know, came through those delegated powers. That is a very specific example. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Toronto, so I work in apartments, so it's pretty much every apartment building is owned by uh, a nice old Jewish man or a nice old Italian man. That's pretty much it. So, and and when I extend down that path, I think of the developers and all of these guys and how they negotiate and get deals done. Um, how did these guys approach you over the years? And uh, <laughs> you know, I like you are as ethical as can be, but did anybody ever try to? you know, oh, Jennifer, maybe we'll give you this cottage or something if you allow our development to go through. Is there anything like that? <laughs> well, you know, first of all, let me say I have lots of stories, um, <laughs> yeah. which I will never tell. Um, and you're right. I, I think I got a reputation very quickly for being pretty, obviously being very ethical and being very clean in how I approach things. And when people know that about you, um, they don't even try because they know they're not going to get anywhere. Um, but I still do have some very, very funny stories of people trying um, that, you know, and most of them are they're just really funny stories. That's all they that that's all they are. Mm -hmm. But I also did a bunch of things, um, for lack of a better word, to make the process cleaner and clearer. So yeah. there's been a tradition for many years in Toronto of developers bringing their lawyers to meetings to negotiate. And the city planners are in a really bad position because they don't go counsel in the room, but they're negotiating with someone else's lawyer. So one of the things that I did right when I became chief planner was I said, from now on, no more lawyers in the room. And we tell developers that if they bring their lawyer, we are bringing our lawyer and we need to, which is what the way it should be, right? Right. And so the staff had, I would argue, had been pushed around for quite a bit. Um, and, you know, fair enough on the industry side, they were getting away with what they could. So I had this uh, one meeting with um, with a developer who will remain unnamed, but who fits the description that you put forward. And he showed up with his lawyer and we went into the negotiation and I pulled him outside in the hallway and I said, can we just chat for a minute? And he came out in the hallway and I said, look, I said, uh, this is actually a planning matter. It's not a legal matter, this negotiation. And my planning staff are prepared to negotiate with your planner, but not with your lawyer. Your lawyer should not be in the room. And we believe we can come to a um, satisfactory resolution, planner to planner. 
and we, you know, we don't want the threat of um, of a solicitor uh, in the in the conversation, changing the entire dynamic of the negotiation in the conversation. And I can tell you, I thought he was going to fall through the floor. He was like, you you're gonna, you want me to ask him to leave? And I said, I'm so sorry, but yes, you're going to have to ask him to leave. <laughs> and he was, I honestly thought he was going to fall through the floor. Like, I don't think anyone had kind of pushed back with him in this way. But what that did was it hit the reset button and it started giving my, my planners more authority to negotiate as planners with other planners instead of always being back on their heels because they were negotiating with a lawyer and they're not lawyers and they right. shouldn't be negotiating with a lawyer. So, um, yeah, there were some, there's some great stories. Most of them are just, most of them are just funny stories. You know, there's, n there's no big movie in this. <laughs> right. Yeah. Not yet. Not, Not yet. <laughs> okay. So Jennifer, you've obviously have a, a very significant national scope from your planning days where you ran your private firm, uh, obviously very in depth with, you know, the city of Toronto, and now you're obviously consulting globally to cities across the world. Um, what are some of the pain points that you can see in terms of the city of Toronto's planning process compared to, you know, other cities systems? Uh, what are the other cities doing better than Toronto is? Well, the first thing I'll say, which I think is always a little bit shocking for people to hear, and the more I get out globally and work in cities around the world, I see this, is that there's a culture within city planning departments that permeates many of those departments that is, um, on the one hand, very bureaucratic, and on the other hand, incredibly regulatory. And you take those th two things together and you can really grind things to a halt. And that's a characteristic that exists in many cities. I will tell you it exists in Melbourne. It exists in Sydney. It exists in Los Angeles. <laughs> it's not unique to Toronto, but it's a, a characteristic that's almost inherent to the way planning departments have grown up over the 21st century, where they focused more on regulations than they have focused on outcomes in city building. And so... What I was trying to do as chief planner was to shift my city planners as thinking about themselves as city builders as opposed to regulators. You're not someone who says yes or no. You're someone who says, how can we get this done? This is good for the city. How can we get it done? Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the challenges that the city planning department has today, like many of its counterparts around the world, that often when someone shows up with a really bold, interesting, good idea, they still say, oh, yeah, we've never seen this before. I don't think we can do that. And the problem is you want to do things you've never seen before. That's how you make the city better. But there's sort of inherently there's something in the DNA of the bureaucracy and the traditional regulatory function that makes it difficult um, for that mindset to shift. Like, it's really tricky to do that. And um, so I think that you know, my biggest observation would be that, first of all, city planning department in Toronto is dealing with an astronomical amount of volume, and they are always back on their heels because they just don't have enough staff, and that the very best planners, and there are exceptional planners in the planning department, have have made that shift from being a regular later to being a city builder, and sometimes they end up fighting with people in other, like the engineering department, we had this in North York on the Lawrence Heights project where we wanted to put in Woonerfs, shared streets, shared streets for cycling and walking, you know, and the engineering department was saying, no, 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 it has to be a tradition, traditional suburban right of way, like a big wide street with big tall street lights. Well, no, 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 this is a pedestrian street in a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. The street should be narrow. The street light should be low. It should have a sense of character and a sense of place. And so, Sometimes city planners really have to struggle because they're kind of pushing with other departments as well. Right. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, <laughs> it's interesting to, to to hear about all of the balance that you have to you know the different issues that you're putting weight on to. Like I, I mean, when we had uh, Greg Lintern on the podcast uh, a few months back. I, I thought it was hilarious that like we ended the podcast, I think at like six or 7 PM and you know, he's back to the office, you know, these guys are, are working hard and, and juggling these issues night and day as well. So, um, 
Can you tell us about, uh, you know, one thing you mentioned was getting people to see ideas that they haven't really worked on before, even if they're for the benefit of the city or the country or, or whatever it may be. Um, you had a quite a successful run for for mayor. Can you tell us a little bit about the platform of what you were hoping to do uh, for the city? Like yeah, what- for sure. Well, just to reinforce the point that you made about Greg Lintern, um, the city planners at the city work 24 seven, like they, <laughs> they work incredibly long hours and my hat goes off every single one of them. Um, so there's a risk in cities. The cities actually stay static. They Their governance stays static. The way they think of spaces stay static, even though the city is changing. Mm-hmm. So in Toronto, if you add a lot more people, you add a lot more housing, but you don't change the way people move, you're going to get gridlock because you can't move people in a dense urban city of 3 million people the way people moved when you had the same amount of space with 1 million people. Right. So my candidacy was really very much about a forward-looking approach to the city that anticipates the changes and the evolutions that we're going to be going through as a city, but also really tackles some of the um, the social injustices, the social inequities that are becoming more accelerated in the city, tackles them in a really proactive way. You know, um, policing is actually a reactionary way to deal with gun violence. Um, there's a tremendous amount of literature on the power of mentoring programs and after after school programs to dealing with gun violence in a city. Um, and some people would say, oh, well, that's a long term solution. No, it's not. There's 14 year olds out there right now who if you got them in a program tomorrow, you could be avoiding them getting into gun violence within mm-hmm. the next three months. That's a, not a long term solution. That's an immediate response to um, the lack of of opportunity for certain populations in our city. So really, I think the best way to characterize my run for office was that I focus forward looking people centered approach to government, which is very different from uh, seeing people um, or thinking in terms of policing. It's really thinking about, hey, cities are great, awesome, dynamic places, but we need strong public policies to make sure that they work for everyone. Right. What can you can you give us a like one or an example of just one of those policies and um, what something like what one of those changes might look like? Yeah, I'll give you I'll give you two examples. So the first example is city owns a lot of land. We have affordable housing crisis right now. We could be using that land in a really dramatic way to be creating housing for young people to ensure that young people entrepreneurs can live close to where they were. You know, the reason we have to spend billions of dollars on transit infrastructure is because we haven't created enough housing close to where people work and affordable housing in particular. And I'm not talking about social housing here. Um, I'm talking about housing that is for people who are working, but below market. And really, this is, you know, why New York City works. New York City has a ton of rent controlled housing. New York City has a ton of affordable affordable housing and really dramatic our city owned land to be delivering on that need. So I had a campaign platform building a hundred thousand units of affordable housing on city owned city owned land. So that's one specific example of where we can make the city work better for everyone. Another example is around movement and mobility and we're starting to see this come to roost a little bit in um, with respect to COVID-19 because transit is not going to be the same in the near future, at least. Um, we have an opportunity to really embrace cycling and cycling infrastructure as a true mobility choice in the city. And there's been a bit of a mix up. Uh, people have thought, oh, getting on your bike is a nice thing to do on a Sunday afternoon on Lakeshore. Right. And, you know, that is a nice thing to do. But if you've got a bike and you know how to ride a bike, and we know because we have the stats can data that 36% of our trips are within 
five kilometers of home. If 36%, let's say even 10% of our trips shifted onto bike, so not all of our trips, but some of our trips, our traffic congestion would be gone. A 10% reduction, there's no more traffic congestion at all in the city. So building cycling infrastructure is a way of, as I mentioned before, planning for that future city. You, can, you can't keep adding more people without changing the infrastructure. Right. Yeah, that's... That's that's really interesting. And now even I mean, you mentioned that and I'm thinking of they just had to open up all of Lakeshore for bikers, I think, because of this pandemic a little bit, but also because everybody was just crowding that one bike path uh, along the water. That's right. Uh, we needed more space. Yeah. Uh, what did you think about uh, so I, I'd like to touch on this and then I and then I want to move on to what you mentioned at the beginning of this podcast which is this new chapter, which sounds extremely exciting. Um, but, but first, what did you think of, the, of Google or Alphabet Labs, uh, pull, Sidewalk Labs pulling out of their proposal? Um, you know, is there anything that should have been done differently there? Uh, how, how, would, how are you thinking about that news? Well, there's a lot that should have been done differently. From my perspective, it was just a matter of time before they pulled out because I think they made so many big mistakes so early on. Mm. Um, to have spent $50 million and to have nothing to show for it, for me, that's just mind-numbing. Uh, you wouldn't believe what I could do with $50 million. <laughs> um, and they were on the spin cycle with consultation. Um, I think they made a lot of really, really critical mistakes, which isn't surprising because they aren't developers. And development, urban development processes are complex. And just because you're good at tech doesn't mean you're good at urban development and understand the process of urban development. I think if nothing else, that's what they proved um, on our on our waterfront. They made some really pretty plans. They made some huge promises. It to people like me when they came out with those renderings, promising um, the Mass Timber Institute, it all looked great. But there's no financial model for it. Then they turned around and said, "Oh well, this is what we want to do, but." there's no business case for it. So we need the government to pay for it. Well, right. like, yeah, sure. Come up with a plan and tell everyone else to pay for it too. Um, so the minute they started talking that way, I was like, so wait a minute, you're coming up with a plan that has no business case. And you're telling us your plan can only work if the government gives you money. But like, hello, what is that? Right. It'd be easy then, to make up plans if that was how they worked. Well, any one of us can make up a plan and then go say, hey, I've made up a business plan, but it doesn't make any money. It's not financially viable. And if the government allows me to tax, then my plan will work. <laughs> right. What's that line on your pro forma? Oh, that's the government paying us. Okay. Yeah. That's the okay. government making my model viable, like whatever. <laughs> and by the way, you've got to give me 12 acres of prime waterfront land on top of that. Right. So right. I was a skeptic. From the beginning, I also I, I thought that there was a lot of brouhaha, but I didn't see how it was going to work. And I think that the the biggest mistake that they made, which was an incredible act of bad faith, was when they came forward and said, "Oh, look, we've got this awesome plan. We're going to get the public all excited about it. But then we're going to say we'll only do it if you give us another 112 acres." Right. Right. In what yeah. world? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I, I um, I was, I thought there was. I should say I thought there were, they they cobbled together some excellent best practices from around the world. There wasn't much that was, there was new. It would have been brilliant if the Mass Timber Institute was going to take off, but again, it's something that requires funding. It would need to be a government program. Was my understanding the way it was described to me? Uh, I think it would be a great thing to have, and I'm disappointed that that's not happening. But I really didn't believe the rest of the plan. Um, I really didn't believe it was going to happen. So for me, there wasn't a sense of loss because I didn't think there was something there. I kind of didn't fall for it. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting chess move that they that they did, getting everybody all excited and then having that extra ask. It, it might have worked on a. With a with a different political body, with you know uh, another city, I don't know. It might have worked, but I guess not here. So um, interesting. We have a we have a legacy on our waterfront of an incredibly engaged constituency. 
um, all the good things that you've seen our, our waterfront have become have been because there has been a really really involved um, community in that planning process. So I would say many of the very best things in Waterfront Toronto's plan actually came from Toronto. They didn't come from Alphabet. They came from us as a city. So I'm very hopeful that we can do something spectacular there still. Um, I think when people say, oh, we missed this incredible opportunity, I would say, but it wasn't real. Mm -hmm. Like, obviously it wasn't real or they would have done it, but it wasn't real. So I think that's kind of an unfair thing to do to a city, to make them think they can have something, but only if they'll pay you for it. Right. <laughs> right. The, the Google Alphabet brand doesn't extend <laughs> that far. Mm hmm. Um, OK, can can we talk about uh, can we talk about this next chapter? You had mentioned uh, an exciting development chapter. Um, I th I think sorry you were saying something about affordable housing I think as well. Can you touch on on what's going on? What are you working on now? Sure. So um, well I won't speak about <laughs> you it. You can do a lot with fifty million dollars. I'm sure there's a lot of people who would love to give you money with your expertise to execute. So well I'll tell you something. Finding the money, finding the equity to get this company off the ground has not been the problem. Right. Um, <laughs> there's there's lots of money um for this model and i think because of covid19 that is even more so true because our model we're a limited dividend company um we're like a social enterprise so we give a very stable conservative return mm -hmm. and there's i think a lot of people have just seen their assets go wonky with what's been happening with the market there's going to be more of an appetite than ever for conservative, stable, long-term returns, which is the assumption behind our model. Um, our model prioritizes delivering really high quality, beautiful, affordable rental housing. So we build communities um, and I can't speak in detail about our first project, but we're going to come out and launch the project that launched the whole company when we launched our first project, which we're deep into the weeds in, on right now um and the you know the the backbone to what we're doing is we're trying to get a whole series of different objectives so our projects have an enormous emphasis on environmental sustainability they have an emphasis on creating complete communities so integrating community amenities so people can live um, close to where they work potentially, but more importantly, can access amenities within walking distance of home. Um, there's an emphasis on beauty that's about human dignity. Uh, we unfortunately have not put an emphasis on beauty in our affordable housing in the Canadian context. Because of my work, I've had the privilege of touring affordable housing communities all over the globe. And I have to say, most of them, particularly in Western Europe, you or I would be absolutely thrilled to live in mm. because they've been so beautifully designed and beautifully executed. And so in seeing those communities in places like Amsterdam, um, in Oslo, in Vienna, I've asked the question, why isn't this happening in Canada? And uh, and so I, you know, I've, I've spent a couple years playing with this model and uh, I have I have a, a business partner who's been in both banking and development for many years. And we basically came together. And we've created a model that we're really excited about because we think it, it'll it will potentially be a little bit of a reset in terms of how we think about housing that is just below market. Right. Where where is this going to be? Is this starting in Toronto? Is it starting in? Vancouver in Toronto yeah and then and then is it going to be now development companies grow and expand but is it going to be Toronto based or do, is your vision for it national or you know well what? without without giving you too much detail um no our goal is for our company to be primarily in the GTA um, but we do have a collaboration that we're working on with the University of Southern California and uh, the city of Los Angeles. So we're also um, working on a project that we're getting off the ground in Los Angeles as well. Okay. A quick question. Um, you've obviously seen the planning uh, perspective from pretty much every angle, from the private sector to uh, public sector to now obviously being in development. Um, what are some tips or advice, if any, 
do you have for, you know, say people, developers that are just getting into the industry and, you know, are having to interact with cities for sort of the first time? Oh, that is such a good question, Garrett. Um, because I think that, you know, I, I kind of hinted at this in my comments about sidewalk labs. Um, I think sometimes uh, people think that like if you're tenacious enough and creative enough, you can you can be in development. And the truth of the matter is, and then they get really mad, right? They show up at the city and they say, wow, this is really hard. The city must be the problem. And the truth of the matter is um, development is really complex. It involves multiple players. Um, it's political. Uh, it uh, involves all kinds of regulations and a regulatory framework. So my advice would be not to underestimate the complexity of the landscape of executing a project and to ensure that you have the right expertise. If you think you're going to do it yourself, forget it. You need to hire the right expertise. Um, pretty difficult to do any kind of project, I would say, in the Toronto context without hiring a professional planner. You need to hire a planner. Um, that's why planners exist. And it happened to me all the time at the city. A developer would come in to see me and they would have their knickers in the knot about a project that wasn't going well. And I would say, well, who's your team? And then they would show me their team and I would be like, your team doesn't know what they're doing. You're missing, you're missing expertise on your team. You've got your architect doing the planning. Your architect obviously doesn't know what they're doing or you wouldn't have this big mess on your hands right now. So um, I usually threw it back at them and said, hey, if you don't have the right expertise, then don't be frustrated when city planning pushes back with you because you're missing half of your documents you were supposed to have submitted. So my big advice would be to ensure you bring on your team the expertise that can fill the gap. Like ask, what's your secret sauce that you bring to this process? You might bring money, you might bring vision, you might bring land, you might have land. Figure out what your secret sauce is, but then figure out what the gaps are and make sure you build an exceptional team. And frequently, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll give you one specific example of a developer who showed up with a really interesting and important project and um, he was really frustrated, said he'd been through years and years with the, the, the planners and the planners just project and um, the project was actually, it was a terrible design. There's no other way to put it. Like he was getting pushback from the planners because what he was proposing was something we didn't want to see built in the city of mm -hmm. Toronto. And so I said to him, did your architect read our tall building guidelines at the city? Because we have guidelines that make it clear what we will approve and what we won't approve. And he said, oh, I don't know, my architect's in Dallas. And I was like, oh. okay, excuse me. Um, has your architect seen the site? Has your architect been to Toronto? And I gave him three names, three architects in Toronto who know the tall building guidelines like the back of their hand. They know they know when to push the boundaries. They know what boundaries cannot be pushed. They have a, an established rapport with the city planners. And I can tell you that he went and hired one of those. He fired his architect, went and hired one of those architects, and we had his project uh, approved within six months. Wow. There you go. He had the wrong team. And what? And what's that? Uh, what's that project, Jennifer? <laughs> project, because I'm not going to out the developer. He's a really good guy who actually has done really good, really good development in the city. Uh, um, two two projects since then, and they're they're good projects. Okay, great. Yeah, I thought that might be your response. Uh, <laughs> I'm okay. I'm really interested in this next question. Uh, and we've asked a few guests this, if you had a million dollars and you can put it anywhere in Canada in any asset, uh, where would you get it? Assuming you're looking, where would actually, you leave it, leave it open. Where, where would you put it? Well, I would put it into my development company. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. If that one wasn't there yet, if that one, if, I, if I didn't have that, um, well, that's actually a really good question. Um, well, I would I, I would look for an asset that basically had the principle of a conservative long term return, um, in part because I think 
particularly as it go as it pertains to real estate, we're going to continue to see some wonkiness mm -hmm. over the next year or two. And so I I've always used as a rule of thumb, um, both per personally and in an advisory capacity, that looking at a window of approximately five years is a really strong frame. Um, I think that window has stretched out a little bit. If you're purchasing an asset and you're going to sell it again, within five to seven years or five to 10 years, you can be pretty certain in the Canadian market that in most instances, that is going to be a smart, a smart investment, not in all neighborhoods, not in all sectors, but in general, like as a general principle. So I would be looking for anything that was, um, you know, I wouldn't be investing in commercial real estate. Uh, definitely not right now. Um, I, th I think it's, you know, I think you would want to look at something that is quite a conservative low return is what I would be looking for because there's no, well, there's no get rich quick scenario. Um, and there's also no certainty in what's going to happen in the residential market uh, in the near term. Like I think over time, over the long term, we'll trend upwards. But in the near term, there's going to be some pretty big bumps that we can't quite put our finger on yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's interesting. Uh, so now I'm sad because there's no get rich quick uh, answer. They even can't get his money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I, I was gonna, I was gonna go to our, our final question. Uh, Garrett, are you okay with that? Or do you have a, go for it. Okay. Um, so this, this final question is called the three truths. Um, it's, so years from now, uh, imagine Jennifer that you you live till you know over a hundred year wonderful life, and all you know you have tons of kids and grandkids and everyone, uh, and and for whatever reason it's your last day, and everyone who you love and who loves you is all around you and they're sitting around you, and but for whatever reason the podcast, the books that you've written, and all the interviews that you've done they've all been erased, and you only have three short notes that you can write to everyone your friends and family and the people who love you. What do you put on those notes? Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> a lot of pressure. Um, well, I know the first thing that will go on the notes, um, which is that um, I think we all crave meaning. And if you can figure out your meaning and you can line the things that you do every day with what you believe in then your everyday wins and losses and struggles and trials and tribulations will be easy to endure because you've really got a higher purpose you're a part of something bigger and you know after i ran for mayor as an example i was very proud we we whipped together our campaign. As everyone knows, I was a last minute entry, but we put out excellent policy that I believe in to this day and I continue to advocate for this day. And I believe that the way we push the public debate really mattered and continues to matter. And because of that, you know, let's face it, losing is terrible. Losing sucks. There's no doubt about it. Uh, it's always better to win than to lose. But when you lose, and even when you lose big sometimes, and losing a mayoral race is, is something you feel deeply and the team around you feels deeply, if, you, if, if it was a part of that bigger purpose, then you don't feel lost at the end of it. I didn't feel like, now what do I do with myself? Because everything I did in that mayoral campaign was aligned with my purpose that I had when I built my company, that I had when I was chief planner, and that I have today. So none of that's changed. So if you can align what you do around your central values and what you believe about humanity and, and making the world a better place, then um, the hard moments, you'll get through them. You'll be pulled through them because you'll get back on the saddle and do the work that needs to be done. That's my first note. I might only have two. Okay. That, was fun. that wasn't a short note. So I'll just- I mean, That's one pack to punch though, so. Okay. If I can do it. So my second note will be something my mother taught me. Um, my mother taught me that my work, and I think this is a true of no matter what your work, 
that your work can be a beautiful gift that you give the world. And uh, it's no secret that I kind of work all the time. I work super hard. Um, and I don't do that. Maybe I am a workaholic. I do that. I, I do feel that my work has value. And I do feel that even when I make mistakes, um, my work is, is it, it's, it's a gift I give the world. And I think that if all of us thought that way about whatever our work is every day, um, and I know people who have um, the relatively rote jobs who feel that way about what they do every day, and people who have very complex jobs who feel that way. But I do think, you know, it's maybe a very Buddhist idea that our get, our work can um can be this profoundly valuable thing and i think that is something that um it links back to the first one around meaning mm -hmm. but um if you if you can figure that out a way for your work to be a beautiful thing that you give the world man you'll live you'll live a great your great life um i i think that's really true the third thing on my note would have to be something about um you know, I know a lot of people in my work. I've come in contact with a lot of people, um, but I have a very, very small, I would say, group of really, really close friends. Um, people whose, you know, couch I can fall asleep on in the middle of a party at eight o'clock on a Saturday night because I'm so tired and they won't think twice. They just know that's the thing I do because <laughs> I do. <laughs> I often fall asleep. <laughs> at parties <laughs> um, at social gatherings because I'm tired um, but I think if you can be so blessed to have people in your family or a small group of friends of people who truly truly know you and still love you man that's a life worth living for sure that is awesome you're <laughs> awesome uh Okay, uh, and just before we sign off, uh, I would recommend that everybody goes and checks out the Webby award-winning Invisible City podcast hosted by Jennifer Keysmat um, uh, on the same level of, as Oprah, which we... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oprah won a Webby, you won a Webby. Uh, so very, very cool. Uh, strongly recommend checking that out. And uh, Jennifer, thank you so much for, uh, for giving us your time today. It was my pleasure. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for asking. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you.